Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the podcast. I'm here with uh, Robin Hansen today, and um, he's here to talk about um, AI um, and specifically the alignment problem. I, you know, I started looking into this uh, uh, issue um, seriously over the last few months, and I didn't really, you know, I was really actually surprised. I didn't know there were smart critics of sort of AI, what I call AI doomerism. Um, I recently discovered uh, Steven Pinker wrote, um, had a long exchange with uh, uh, Scott Aronson about this. Um, and then the, you know, I, uh, I am ashamed to say uh, I didn't discover the great Hansen uh, Eliza uh, debates from about a decade, a decade and a half ago um, until very recently. And so, you know, I've been reading your stuff, Robin, and we you know one of the essays. Uh, you talk about, um, you know, you you explain this. You say some people looked at the AI alignment problem, thought it wasn't such a big deal, um, and they moved on and they didn't keep writing about it. And the people who did think it was a big deal sort of became obsessed with it. And they're the people we hear from all the time. Um, and so, I, you know, what's what's I, what is the um, what do you think? You have a lot of objections, I think, to to doomerism, but there's um, uh, what's what's the heart of it? Well, what's the heart of the problem with the idea that there's going to be something that's so smart it makes us look at like ants and that basically it can do whatever we want and we can't hope to control it and foresee it and you know we're, we're all going to be at its mercy and potentially die well what's what's the argument against this so um i think you're right that there's this very common phenomena whereby most people have some sort of default views about the world and history and the future and then some smaller groups come to a contrarian view that is a view that on the face of it would seem unlikely from some broad considerations. And then they develop a lot of detailed discussion of that. And then they try to engage that with the larger world. And then what they get usually is a big imbalance of attention in the sense that they like think of 9-11 truthers or something, right? <laughs> They're going to talk about this building and this piece of evidence and this time and this testimony or something. And people on the outside are just going to be talking mainly about like the very idea of this thing. And this is this at all plausible? And the insiders are going to be upset that they don't engage all their specific things and they introduce terminology and concepts and things like that. And they have meetings or they invite each other, you know, talk a lot. And the outsiders are just at a different level of, does this really make much sense at all? <laughs> And then when the insiders are trying to get more attention and their outsiders, some of them will engage, there'll be a difference between like some very high profile people who just give very dismissive content, concept, content, comments versus lower status people who might look at their stuff in more detail. And they're just going to be much more interested in engaging that first group than the second, <laughs> because the fact that somebody high profile even discussed them is something you know worthy of note. And then the fact that this person was very dismissive and doesn't really know much of their details in their mind, you know, supports their view that, you know, they're right and the other people are just neglecting them, right? So, so here, the, the key thing to notice is just on the face of it, they're postulating something that seems a priori, pretty unlikely relative to a background of the past and other sorts of things. That would be the crux of the main response is to say, look... What are you proposing here? And how would that look if we had seen it in the past? Like, how unusual would that be? So, uh, as you know, you know, the world is really big. <laughs> and the world has been growing, but relatively steadily and slowly for a long time. And for a long time, uh, basically, any one innovation anywhere found in the world make, made usually a modest difference to a particular local region or industry. And the net effect on the world has been pretty small. And it's been the net effect of lots of innovations like that that made up the world changing. And that any one organization in the world is typically a small part of the entire world. And anything that happens in that one organization doesn't affect the whole world that much. It affects the people involved in that organization. And the world progress is more the net effect of some organizations and ventures growing and shrinking, et cetera, and changing selecting over time, right? So that's history. <laughs> okay. And so in that scenario, you would be really surprised to see one particular venture in one place that on a global scale was hardly even noticed, doesn't even show up in the catalogs or something. <laughs> and then, you know, on a very short time scale compared to how fast the world grows, that one thing suddenly 
grows so fast that in a very short time, it takes over the world faster than anybody can even notice it to react it, to oppose it. And not only that, during that period of very rapid growth, its priorities radically change. Uh, that is, it starts out with a certain sort of behavior and priorities, and, and there, it seems that its priorities are consistent with what it usually does. And then during that very fast evolution, its priorities change radically so that it basically wants something orthogonal, arbitrarily, or randomly different. And then because it takes over the world and now it implements these arbitrary orthogonal priorities. So that's, compared to history, a pretty unlikely scenario. That would be the most fundamental objection is you got to overcome my prior here of that just doesn't happen. Mm, okay. Yeah. Okay. So there's a prior that, yeah, things, the world doesn't end because the world usually doesn't end. Humans are usually not, um, have never been uh, exterminated and they've never been exterminated sort of by the uh, uh, by the process, something even close to resembling the process, Yudowski uh, 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 piece sort of posits from from sort of the reasoning. But you know, so it's, so, but still, these ideas, you know, they do overcome a lot of people's priors, um, and a lot more than other things that people say that it's gonna, you know, that, that are gonna end the world. You know, most smart people are not joining, you know, apocalyptic cults. I mean, the you know, really smart people in Silicon Valley and other areas of life are not you know, buying into sort of other kinds of doomsday uh, scenarios. So people do find something about the logic um, of this compelling, right? And they, you know, I think that, the, you know, and they think that the the steps are, you know, each sort of step in the logical chain is solid enough on its own that we put them, we could just posit three or four things and we put them together and then, um, you know, we can overcome that prior that, not, you know, something's not going to come out of nowhere in the world, right? So these, these you know, these assumptions are um, intelligence is a real thing that goes on some kind of scale from like, you know, bacteria to a normal human to Einstein to, to something else. Um, and then, um, you know, it's hard for a lower intelligence to foresee what a, a higher intelligence is going to do, even if you know, even if you're the programmer, even if you program what the goals are. Um, there's a, uh, the idea that if you are highly intelligent, you could probably improve yourself and gain more. Uh, that's a recursive process. You could gain more intelligence. Um, and that's basically, I mean, that's, that's, that's basically it, right? Um, so where, where in the lo logical chain do you think the, where's the weakest link? I mean, any ordinary corporation is a super intelligence of sorts. That is, it's much more capable than any individual human. It of course can improve itself. Corporations do improve themselves, but they don't do it very fast. <laughs> so we're positing a very unusual rate of improvement of this one system, not only compared to the past, but compared to the other similar systems in the world at that time. So we it's not enough merely posit that. Uh, you have to consider, you know, why it would be so unusually fast, so terribly unusually fast. I mean, of course, you know, we can talk about cities sometimes grow, and some cities grow faster than others, firms sometimes grow, but Individual cities don't take over the world because they're capable of growing, nor do individual firms take over the world, right? So we're not just talking about some degree of growth and maybe some variation of growth. We're talking sort of a crazy extreme scenario of that. Hmm. Yeah, I, I like the analogy of um, firms more than more than cities here, right? Because the firms is a very interesting one because firms do have a goal. We could talk about a firm's goal. I mean, I think it'd, it'd be coherent. Mm -hmm. To talk about a city's goal, I think is you know, you could the mayor could have a program, but it, it's much less, um, it's much less clear um, that you could talk about that. So just let's we could I guess we could take the we could take the firm thing. So Walmart is a super intelligence, right? Um, it has uh, stores, you know, all over the world. It has you know millions of products that it stocks the shelves with. It uh, it has a payroll. It has you know distribution. It has lo logistics. Um, it's involved in local communities. And yeah, I think that's 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 very interesting. Like Walmart can improve itself, and it has data, and it has you know money, but it, it's incremental, and it's facing off against 
other forces in society, competitors, right? Other stores, uh, other uh, online shopping, you know, things that pe- grab people's attention. Um, and so, yeah, that makes that makes sense. I mean, is it like the, um, it, you know, is it is it because it's all just the intelligence in the uh, in the computer? Is it because it's all hardware? Does that make a difference? It's like you have a code, right? Um, and the code gives you a, a human level of a superhuman level of intelligence. Um, is it the fact that it's, it's just code? Um, can that, you know, does that matter? <laughs> I mean, is that easier than doing, doing something else in the real world like Walmart might do? So in the past and today, the world co-evolve in the sense that it's composed in many parts, all of them depending in some way on each other and all of them trying to grow. And whenever we try to improve any one part of it, we're opportunistically looking for what other parts could most help with that. So, yes, some things happen in silicon, and the things in silicon we try to improve, and other things happen out here in real life, and we try to improve those. And we opportunistically try to use code to improve code when we can, use people to improve code when we can, use code to improve warehouses and stockyards when we can. I mean, we're just trying to use everything to improve everything. But... The status quo is that when we do our best to improve things, the rate of growth and change is what we see. That is, we're presumably improving things as fast as we can. So the question is, where is this sudden, vast improve scale of, of rapid improvement coming from? I mean, it has to be, we suddenly find some much easier way of doing something really important. Yeah, but could you say that? Well, you know, it's our rate of improvement. Uh, like, you know, if you want to measure by economic growth or scientific knowledge or whatever, um, you know, compared to the rate of improvement among chimpanzee society or you know ant society or something, it's you know exponentially higher or infinitely higher because there is you know no besides evolution, they're putting putting that as a sort of a cultural uh, pro- progression. Um, so we're we're you know so we're improving a lot faster than these less intelligent beings. Uh, maybe a being that is more intelligent than us will be magnitudes of you know uh, uh, you know uh, basically much much improving much faster to the same extent that we improve faster than say chimpanzees do. Is it, the intelligence I think is what gets people. It's like this is really really smart. We're smart. We have an analogy: humans to ants. Okay, there'll be something compared to humans that is much smarter than us. And so why, why can't it, why can't it, why can't that be a good argument? Well, in our world today, we have parts of the world that vary by many parameters, right? There's rich nations and poor nations. There's say capital intensive industries and labor intensive industries. There's industries where the employees tend to be very well educated industries where the employees are less well educated. Uh, and in all of these places we're in each one, we're trying to improve it the best we can. And when we find some areas of the world where we can improve it faster, we do. That is, investment resources focus more on the areas in the world where you can more rapidly improve things at a lower cost. But the world we see is the net result of that prioritization where we do our best to find the most promising places to make improvements at the lowest cost and do them. We already see a variation in intelligence of the world that is certainly there are people in places where more smarts is concentrated than in other places, but that's the result of our efforts to prioritize and invest as best we can. But our simple economic prediction, which seems to be roughly right, which is that on the margin, a dollar spent in each possible area of investment will get about the same ret- risk adjusted returns because we have focused on our efforts on the most promising things and produced diminishing returns there. So it is, you know, it's just not a good investment. You say, gee, I'm going to allocate my money according to what companies are smarter. <laughs> Find some measure of which companies are smarter and put your money in that and have a hedge fund that that's its strategy. It's not going to make money compared to the other investment funds. Yeah. I, um, yeah, the uh, bringing up the idea that we already have superhuman intelligence, I think, is very interesting. When you brought up firms, that sort of that made me, that made me think. When you, when you bring, when you, uh, you know, you can talk about the market, although again, the goal thing it makes it you know a little bit harder, but the firm is I think just such a good analogy because it's a big thing. It's way smarter. I mean, Walmart is much smarter than you know any human being could be, and we could talk about it having goals, and we could talk about having influence in the world. And I think that analogy is is, is really good. I wonder, you know, markets are also super intelligence, but markets you know don't have goals. They, you know, they're sort of 
abstract market is an abstract way of talking about sort of the aggregation of uh, the goals of uh, various uh, actors. Um, is there something else like firms that we could uh, countries maybe? Once you allow the distinction between big things in our world that are useful that have goals and that don't, and that you say we have big chunks of the world that are useful and that don't have goals, and you might say, well, if you're worried about AI with goals, <laughs> just don't use the versions with goals. Just use yes, the versions without point. goals. That is, yeah. that is pretty much all the actual useful computer systems out there are not general agents with sort of general goals about their whole future and how all the actions they can take in their world. They tend to be specialized tools for specialized purposes, and they are focused on doing those specialized things. So, you know, that seems to be a reasonable path forward to the future, if to the extent you're worried about AIs having goals. Um, but, you know, the example of firm says we can also have agents with goals <laughs> and super intelligent agents with goals exist and seem to be reasonably well aligned with this in our world. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Um, and then, you know, as far as the goal thing, I've always, I've been a little bit confused on this point from the perspective of the people who, the people who are worried about AI. Um, I was watching uh, Eliza Yudowski, um, uh on a podcast recently. It was it was a, it was a uh, they got a lot of attention online. I forget what the podcast is called. And actually, I wanted I wanted him to debate you right now on this, but actually, he didn't he didn't get back to you unfortunately. So hopefully, one day I'll I'll be able to talk to him. Um, the uh, um, the uh, you know he said something like uh, we you know, we can't solve the alignment problem because we have no idea how to give a computer a goal of make this strawberry, like kind of, you know, just a, not a real strawberry, just a, make this strawberry down to the very molecule, an exact copy of it, you know, make another strawberry that's an exact copy molecule by molecule of this strawberry and not destroy the world. And I was like confused by this and I don't know if there's something I don't know about computer programming, um, but it sounds to me like if you could give the instructions, um, uh, make a strawberry molecule by molecule, and that's all it takes, and the computer could figure out what to do with that. Why can't you say, don't destroy the world, or don't do this in a way that will make the human creator of the program, you know, regret it? Why? Why is it? Why aren't things like these, like you know, considered realistic? Uh, uh, I should probably ask him, but you know, for, right. you're familiar with their argument, sure. so you know, what, what's the? Why can't that be a solution? So. In our world, whenever you give an employee or an associate some assignment, uh, you give them a bunch of implicit uh, context to that. You say, you know, here's a, the resources available to you to achieve that assignment, <laughs> and these are sort of this is sort of the scope in which you're allowed to act. And um, you know that there's the rest of the world out there that you should try not to mess with, <laughs> and you know there's boundaries where you should stay within those boundaries and try to achieve your assignment within those boundaries. Um, and you will, right, typically. Now, the claim is that if you give a very powerful agent who has full scope of everything, it can do anything it wants in the universe, and it's willing to do anything it wants in the universe, and you give it some sort of abstract goal, like make a copy of a strawberry, then unless you constrain it very carefully, the claim is, well, it'll achieve that purpose in its most cost-effective way, and maybe as a side effect, destroy vast swaths of the rest of the universe in order to achieve this one particular stated goal. So the question is then, can you make clear to it uh, all the other things it's not supposed to do in order to do this one thing? Now, again, as limited agents in our world, that's sort of implicit. You give me an assignment and I know that I can't change the universe. I know that I can only do a limited range of things and I'll try to achieve your purposes with my limited resources but I will know I have all these limits. But he's postulating this other sort of creature, vast and powerful, and really without limits on its capabilities. And so by assumption, there's basically there's only one of these things. If there were a million of them, certainly any one of them would face the limits of all the rest of the million. And he would have to figure out a way to make the strawberry while not pissing off all the other million AIs who are similarly capable. But if you just imagine one of them, why it might go do arbitrary things in the pursuit of this goal you gave it. Yeah. But what, why, why do they think that's, why do they think that's plausible? Like, well, why do they think that it would like, why can't you? Okay. It's intelligent. It, it can, <laughs> they're positing. It can do a lot. It can, uh, you know, make, you know, can kill humanity. It can destroy the world. Um, it can do X, Y, Z, but, and you could program it. And there's some unforeseen consequence of what you program the goal. 
Um, but why can't part of the utility function, the goal is like, don't make us regret having created you as, as a species. It has a theory of mind, right? It can understand humanity right. well enough to manipulate uh, humanity. It can understand um, humanity well enough to, you know, in these scenarios, control nations and, uh, you know, get them to do all kinds of things. Why, what's stopping, you know, what's the answer as to why uh, we can't just tell it, you know, don't make us regret this, basically? Well, I mean, obviously, one, you have to ask, what happens if we interpret these things very literally? Mm. <laughs> That's often... Don't make, you know, us regret, don't make us regret this. Okay, it kills us, and we will never yes, regret it. Well, that will achieve that. Or just rearranges your brain so you no longer regret anything ever. I see. You, you do have to be careful about what you wish for in these cases. But, I mean, the scenario is you've got this genie, and so it's sort of a Lad Aladdin's lamp sort of scenario. You've got this genie who will do what you say, perhaps, but not in the way you intended. And it's very powerful, and you have to be careful about what you say. Uh, but in a world where there's this genie who can do anything, and there aren't other genies who constrain it, and it's trying, perhaps, to misunderstand you, then you have to be careful. Yeah, but usually the genie thing is, it's like, um, you know, it's like you give a sentence, like, you know, make me a ham sandwich, and like, you know, it makes you right. into a ham sandwich or something. We could write, okay, well, if I think if, you know, if we got together, we can write 10 paragraphs or you know, even a book sort of explaining what we mean by, uh, you know, uh, you know, and judges and judges do this too. Like, you know, sure. judges, they'll, they'll have, you know, a law and it won't be exact, but they'll say, okay, we sort of understand the context, context. We understand what the purpose of the law is. So it, 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 they'll, de they'll depart from the, you know, why can't we say be like, you know, be our ideal of like a, the, you know, the median humans ideal of a uh, wise jurist. Um, when there is doubt, and then write a 300-page book about all the things it, it, it should and should it do. Like, could, could that be a solution? So I think what we're talking about is related to the distinction between planning and, say, reactive ad adaptation. So if you have a housekeeper, say, or an assistant, um, you can work with them to get them to understand roughly what you want, and then you can give them very brief instructions, and they can reliably give you roughly what you want because you can have adaptation. You can, if you see the first time you give them an assignment and they do something off, you can say, no, that's not what I meant. And then you can uh, instruct them. And then with the process of feedback that way, you can get to a place where you can roughly guess the kind of assignments they can do and they can figure out roughly what you meant by them and things work well. That it would be different if you had to write down these instructions for this new housekeeper and that was it. You would never get a chance to correct them. And when you saw the misunderstandings, it was too late to do anything. So that's what they're worried about with this rapid growth scenario, that uh, it'll happen so fast that as you start to see it go wrong, you won't have a chance to stop it or correct it. You have to specify everything ahead of time. And you have to sort of imagine all the scenarios the future universe could be in <laughs> ahead of time and have some specification that covers all those possibilities before you have much of an idea of what it's going to want or what it might be able to do. Yeah. Yeah. And what are, what are, what are sort of the dominant, um, because, you know, I was listening to, uh, Yudowski's, um, uh, podcast and it doesn't, he, he seemed completely hopeless. Did, did you listen to this podcast? He was, you know, very, very, it was very dark. Uh, no, I didn't, but I've heard him many times before. Okay. <laughs> so you, you've got your, you've got your fill. Yeah. Your debates were very long. Uh, but, but he's, uh, but you know, he's, he's updated over time and he's become sort of more pessimistic. Now he's, you know, he saw, he had an essay, you know, just have death with dignity and chat GPT and all these other things are sort of, you know, scaring him. So he's, you know, he's same, a lot of the same arguments, but now more convinced he's right and more pessimistic, uh, about our ability to do anything about it. Um, and is, uh, and so, um, and so, well, but he, he, from what I was, from what I was listening recently, he basically thinks there's been no progress on, on this. And you know, what what are these people? What are the AI alignment people exactly doing? Um, you know, can, can you can you sort of can you do you have any idea? Like, what are they? Are they like thinking of like the instructions you give to the super intelligence that will like not give you this genie problem, or are they like, well, what exactly is their solution? I, can you explain to me well, like what working on AI alignment the actually means? analogy to the problem would be imagine that in the year 1500, you had some foresight to imagine that in the 20th century, there would be, you know, vast corporations and tanks and planes and nuclear weapons. And you were trying to give advice about how people in that distant future should manage their problems with 
geopolitical strategy and war and weapons and the modern economy and cars, right? The problem is they would hardly know anything about these things. <laughs> and so they would struggle to find abstractions, even to talk in terms of, that could apply to that future. And then you might have some specific things in your world that you think is sort of like that future world, like a windmill. You say, well, windmill is kind of like a machine we expect to see in the future. And so you would be doing two basic very things. First, you would just be struggling with a very abstract level to come up with abstract formulations and descriptions that would be roughly applying to this future era and then reason about those abstractions. Or you would take the most concrete things around you that you think are analogous to that and focus on, well, how do we control a windmill? What happens if somebody fights with a windmill? What do we, you know, what if, if there's an organization that owns a windmill, what do we do about that? And you'd, you'd be practicing through those sorts of concrete, you know, variations in order to prepare for the coming future world. So that's in essence what the, you know, AI risk people have been doing because we know so little about what future AI would be like in terms of its organization or priorities or structures or constraints, they uh, either just talk at the very abstract level of, a, of an agent and a general agent with general algorithms and just talk, how could you specify for a general agent with general algorithms, the kind of features or constraints you wanted to give it? That's one sort of approach. And the other approach is to take the most recent versions of the future systems are worried about, say, large language models or reinforcement learning models and say, well, if if the future AIs would have concern were this sort of model, what would we do to control them? And that's what they've been doing. And yeah. the very abstract stuff, you know, has made relatively limited progress, as you might expect. It's just really <laughs> hard to do much at that level. And the more specific ones, you know, they can catalog the kinds of problems that occur and fix them, but they aren't very big problems. And so they don't feel like they're actually solving the fundamental problems because the big problem they have about a rapidly self-improving thing, that's not showing up in these concrete systems in front of them. And the things that people complain about in the concrete systems in front of them, that they're too racist or whatever, or they're not, they're offending people. And then there's a lot of people trying to figure out how to regulate AI so they don't do that. And, you know, you can either focus on those or try to find analogous problems of just saying, like, hey, anytime one of these systems doesn't do something we expect, that's like a failure of control. And let's just try to get on all of those problems. Yeah. And yeah, there's, I mean, the, uh, yeah, I mean, and then their argument, uh, you guys, you and uh, you and the debate, you guys call it f FOOM, right? The, right. the, the takeoff scenario. Um, and I guess their argument is we have, we have no choice. It's going to be a, a millisecond between the time it develops a, what a, you know, uh, 200 IQ and the time it develops a 5,000 IQ and then a divide that develops a million IQs and then, right. you know, our heads will explode, right? They're, they're saying it's basically, um, <laughs> this is, this is by necessity. All we can do is sort of make these analogies, right? Right. Cause they don't know what much details about the systems that will be a problem. Mm. And so, you know, and so if you, if you were convinced that they were, let's say, right about most of these things about, you know, the possibility of foom, um, would your would your view be uh, uh, there's no point in worrying about it because it's it's hopeless just to waste time and we just sort of have to wait for it to happen because you know there's no there's no way to align this thing without you know without any experience or knowing what it's going to look like. I mean, it depends on when in the process, I guess. So you know, if you get closer to seeing more what the system might be like, so there's two main actions you can do here. One is you could increase resources toward their alignment sort of efforts. And the other is you could try to slow down progress in AI and related fields. Um, those have very different consequences. But uh, the first thing is relatively cheap. You might say, hey, you know, compared to the size of the world, it doesn't cost that much to throw a lot more resources into these sort of attempts. So why not? Trying to slow down AI progress in the world would have pretty big consequences. Uh, and I think we're in a world where we have, in fact, over the last half century or so, you sort of slowed down progress in a lot of areas that people were scared of. And you can imagine AI being another one of those areas. Uh, you can also imagine it not. That seems to be more of an open question. But um, the question is just how bad do you think it is? An analogy would be, say, with nuclear power, the more you thought that there was just going to be a really huge nuclear accident if we allowed people to make nuclear power plants and it was going to, you know, blow up half the world, then you might say just, nope, no power plants, 
nothing at all. Just don't allow it. We'll just, just going to do stay with coal or whatever and just not, not allow it or put vast resources into trying to study how to do safe nuclear power plants. Um, yeah. And there was, and the, uh, impact of that is not, is not encouraging, right? We basically just have no more, uh, nuclear, nuclear power plants. But if you thought, you know, if you thought FUM was a real thing, you know, you might, you might, you might take that, you might take that hit. Um, yeah. Right. And so, but I mean, again, the, the key thing is there's this key unusual part of the scenario, right? That is you, if you lay out the scenario and say, which of these parts looks the most different from prior experience, it's this postulate of this sudden acceleration and very, very large acceleration, right? So we have a history of innovation. That is, we've seen a distribution of the size of innovations in the past. Most innovation is lots of small things. There's a distribution. Some of them, a few of them are relatively big, but um, you know, none of them are that huge. I, I would say the largest innovations ever were in essence, the innovations underlying the arrival of humans, farming and industry, because they allowed the world economy to you know, accelerate in its growth. But they didn't allow one tiny part of the world to accelerate its growth. They allowed the whole world to accelerate its growth. So we're postulating something of that magnitude or even larger, but concentrated in one very tiny system. That's the kind of scenario we we're postulating when this one tiny system finds this one thing that allows it to grow vastly faster than everything else. And I got to say, you know, don't we need a prior probability on this compared to our data set of experience and if it's low enough shouldn't we think it's pretty unlikely <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah that and so there's a you know a related uh essay you wrote on um you know you're saying why you know you're saying this is unlikely and we could just based on you know we could just say based on past experience um but the other one I, you know I, there's another sort of line you know there's there's a sort of um uh, I think one of your better essays that uh, explains sort of why this is unlikely, um, just from a you know from a uh, from just a reasoning uh, perspective, rather than you know looking at looking at history, um, the betterness explosion. Uh, this is really uh, this is this I love this essay because it was very short and it's actually very funny. I just want to read it because I, I actually laughed while reading it, um, and I'm a little bit sick, so this might be hard for me, but it's 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 worth it. <clears throat> because the betterness explosion. This is from 2011. Uh, we all want things. Around us to be better. Yet today, billions struggle year after year to make just a few things a bit better. But what if your meager, what if our meager success was because we just didn't have uh, the right grand unified theory of betterness? What if someone someday discovered the basics of such a theory? When well, then this person might use his basic betterness theory to make himself better in health, wealth, sexiness, organization, work ethic, etc. More important, that might help him make his betterness theory even better. <laughs> And after several iterations, this better person might have a much better betterness theory. Then he might quickly make everything around him much better, not just better looking hair, better jokes, or better sleeps. He might start a better business and get better at getting investors to invest, customers to buy, and employees to work. Or he might focus on making better investments. Or he might run for office and get better at getting elected and then make a city or nation run better. Or he might create a better weapon, revolution, or army to conquer any who oppose him. Via such a betterness explosion, one may one one way or another, this better person might, if so inclined, soon own, rule, or conquer the world. Which seems to make it very important that the first person who discovers the first good theory of betterness be a very nice, generous person who will treat the rest of us well. Right? Okay. So this is this is really funny. And obviously, what your you know be betterness, what your uh, uh, you're just using betterness uh, sort of a, as a joke to make this sort of you know to make this. Uh, look ridiculous because this is basically what they're doing with intelligence, right? They have this thing called intelligence, and it's going to make them better in every single way. Um, and they're going to, you know, somehow take over the world. And so, is the argument is the uh, argument here that intelligence um, is, um, you know, it's it's mul it's multifaceted. Faceted. And you know, when I talk to people about this, the basic the argument that they say is, look, that may be true to an extent, but there is a sense in which we say a human is more intelligent than an ant, right? A human can figure out, you know, any question you give it, um, a human will be better able reasoning through it. Uh, why can't there be something with, you know, super intelligence that is just at a at a different level? Uh, do you think that, or, you know, alternatively, I don't know if this is enough about how much programming works, but why can't you build like, 
you know, a, uh, why can't you build various modules and just sort of put them together? And then that would be sort of a, a superhuman uh, kind of intelligence. Well, what's, uh, is, is there anything to say for the argument that this is just not like betterness, that there is something sort of more solid here that we could sort of hold on to? So the issue is the kind of meaning behind various abstractions we use. So, you know, abstractions are powerful. We use abstractions to organize the world. And abstractions embody sort of similarities between the things out there. And we care about our abstractions and, and which pool we use. But for some abstractions, they are, are they well summarize our ambitions and our hopes, but they don't necessarily correspond to a thing out there where there's a knob on them. You can turn and change them. <laughs> so it's important to distinguish which of our abstractions correspond to things that we can have more direct influence over and which abstractions are just abstractions about our view of the world and our desires about the world. So that's the key distinction here. I mean, we could talk about a good world and a happy world and a nice world, but you know, there isn't a, like a knob in the world to turn out and make the world nicer in some sense. A nice world is the nice world to you. <laughs> it, nice things happen to you, but that's very local to you. Uh, it's not, there isn't sort of a, a, a parameter, a knob out there in the world you can turn and just make the world nicer for everybody because nice isn't exactly you know, a concept that's well describing the world it's describing your reaction to it so better can be more seen as in that way we might think well yeah better is describing us what we see is better and it's an important abstraction to have in the sense that we need to evaluate stuff that happens around us and we need to um, consider which things we prefer but we don't think of the world out there is better or not <laughs> Uh, that we're not looking for like the place in the world where there's a better knob and turn up the better knob and then everything gets better in the world. That's not how we think about the world. Now, intelligence, the question is, what kind of an abstraction is that? So at one level, intelligence is just literally the ability to do many kinds of mental tasks. So then we might say, well, you know, Walmart is intelligent <laughs> because it can do many kinds of tasks because it has 100,000 employees and many of them are very smart and capable. And so Walmart is intelligent because it can do many things. And the United States is even smarter because look, look at all the things the United States can do, right? And so then we might say, well, yes, there is a parameter out there that this is describing, but it's just sort of a general capacity descriptor, like the general wealth and capability of a firm or a country is just this parameter that then it lets it do many things. And then, yes, uh, a more higher capacity entity out there can just do more many things. And sure, then it could do more mental tasks better, and we'll call it more intelligent, right? Now, when we think about these things in the world, they are out there. We might think, look, how do they change? How could you improve one? And that's where the topic of innovation comes from. We say, well, innovation is how things improve or change, is one of the ways. Of course, things can just improve or change by accumulating more capital and resources, and so we have a whole story of economic growth whereby we understand which things can change how. And in that story, we tend to have a relatively lim limited number of high-level abstract parameters that describe things, right? Uh, for a firm or a nation, there's just basically wealth, uh, but there's maybe physical mass and energy and, um, you know, various abstractions. And we say, how could you improve such a thing? How could we make Walmart richer? How could we make the U.S. better? We know about these aggregates. We try to increase the population of the U.S. We could try to make economic growth better. We could try to make overall efficiency better. Then we can talk at that level about making them better in those ways, because those are the kinds of abstractions we have that make sense of describing those systems, right? And so if we look at a small a person, we, you know, in their life, we say, well, they start out young and ignorant, but they have potential. And then we have some ways we describe how they can improve in, with time. They might get more experienced. They might get more knowledgeable. They might get more refined. They might have more connections. Those are the kind of abstractions that make sense to describe an individual and describe how they might improve over time. And if you wanted to talk about who to select for a role, you'd be using those kind of abstractions. You'd want to talk about how to improve somebody. You'd be asking, how could you improve any one of those parameters? And now we have this parameter intelligence, right? And the question is, what's that? How does that fit in with all these other parameters? We don't usually use intelligence, say, as a measure of a country or a measure of a, of a firm. Uh, 
we use wealth or other parameters. If it's equivalent, then fine. If it's something separate, then we want to go, well, what is that exactly? Uh, for an individual, we have this measure of intelligence for an individual in the sense there's a correlation across mental tasks and which ones they can do better. And then the question is, what's the cause of that correlation? Like one theory is that some people's brains just trigger faster. <laughs> and if you got a brain that triggers faster, it can just think faster. And then overall, it can do more. Uh, there are other theories, but you know there are ways to cash out. What is it that makes one person smarter than another? Maybe they just have a bigger brain. That's one of the stories. Brain that triggers faster. Maybe a brain with certain modules that other that are you know more emphasized than others. Then that's a story of the particular features of that brain that makes it be able to do many more tasks. If you just say, why don't, why don't you tell a person to make themselves smarter? <laughs> why don't you tell Walmart to make itself richer? then you have to ask, well, what's the causal process by which you know that parameter can influence itself? And usually that's pretty hard, right? It's hard for a firm to make itself richer just because it wants. I mean, it can if it tries, but we know there's all these limitations. You say, hey, person, make yourself smarter. Then we know, well, they could learn more. They could practice more. Maybe they could try to be more rational, but there's a limited range of things. And so now we're postulating, oh, there's this AI and it just says, I want to be smarter. And then it does it. And it does it really fast. And you go, how did that work? The rest of us can't seem to do that. The rest of us are, find it pretty hard to improve these major parameters about us that we care a lot about. Well, from things so a, million really times, a million times faster than you, that's what they will say. It's, it could do, it could, it could scan the internet, that it could do mathematical uh, calculations, and it can uh, digest all the literature in the universe. And but, you know, all that is not that too far off. So why isn't it just, well, it's, you know, this intelligent, intelligence makes it more intelligent. Because that's not our standard model of economic growth, <laughs> right? So, you know, Walmart has 100,000 employees, say. That doesn't mean it can grow 100,000 times faster. Uh, that's not, I mean, we have to say, what's our best model of growth, how growth works, and what are the key parameters of growth? And the rate at which computers run isn't really a central parameter in that analysis. So... That's sort of imagining there's an algorithm you could run, and when you run that algorithm, then at the end of it, you're smarter. So if you can just run it faster, you'll be smarter faster. But mm. is there such an algorithm? Yeah. And what is what a smarter what a smarter mean? Is I mean, is is your view that you know? Do we even? I mean, do we even know? Yeah. This, I mean, like, is this concept even? Oh, so here's a different way to think yeah. about it. Like I got this from David Lennett long ago with his famous Eurisco system, uh, an AM system, and AI. His idea was that um, there are there's an abstraction uh, hierarchy of concepts that we use in mathematics and elsewhere. There are some very high level abstract concepts, and then there are a lot more specific concepts. And that when we learn things, what we learn sits somewhere in that abstraction hierarchy. We either learn something about something specific, or we learn something about something abstract. We, when we learn something that where our knowledge more naturally sits at a high level in the abstraction hierarchy, then that's going to have a wider scope of application. Uh, when you learn about energy in general, for example, that you learn a lot more than when you learn about coal in particular or about a particular kind of coal in a particular plant, right? So if you run a coal plant, you will, in order to run it, you will use knowledge of various kinds of levels of abstraction. You'll know about where the building is sited and where the pipes come in. That's very specific to that plant. <laughs> You'll know about the particular people who work there and their schedules and their inclinations. And then you might know general things about thermodynamics or, uh, you know, the region, uh, the physics, energy, conservation. The point is that um, knowledge in general sits somewhere in the abstraction hierarchy. And the observation Lennon had, which I think is true, that the vast majority of useful knowledge is pretty far down in the abstraction hierarchy, right? Uh, it's mostly specific. Most of the things we learn is relatively specific. And relatively few are general. But of course, the general things count for more. So if we do an integral, sort of the median, the, the median innovation is pretty far down, but the median weighted innovation by its impact will be higher up. But even so, it's not that high up. Uh, so if we said, if you learn something in general about intelligence, that would be a very high level thing, <laughs> right? That would be something that was true about a very wide range of applications. So like very basic decision theory, say, or very basic algorithm facts. Those would be very high level things you know about that apply to a very wide range of things. And that's more 
learning very general things. And when you learn very general things, that does improve your ability to do a wide range of things. So now the question is, what's the distribution of knowledge in this hierarchy? And can you sort of, by putting more effort into the abstract things, make it happen faster? Or do you sort of just get random draws of insight from all across the hierarchy? And then you might say a, le- a system that's learning is just trying to get more knowledge, but it's going to go at a rate that determined by some growth equation. And then the question is, what's the fundamental growth equation of trying to collect more knowledge? And so this is something I think economists know in terms of economic growth. That is, how do we learn to innovate? Where, what sort of processes tend to produce innovation? And, you know, what's the most cost-effective way to do that? And where does it tend to have the most? But Merely because you have a computer that can run fast, that doesn't mean it's going to do super innovation. (laughs) Because innovation is not just running some algorithms, it's also interacting with the world (laughs) and trying things out and getting ideas from elsewhere. So in our world today, we try as best as we can to innovate. But if we made, you know, researchers think twice as fast, if we had twice as many researchers, we wouldn't necessarily have twice as much economic growth, right? That was a key thing to notice. Uh, therefore, making a researchers run twice as fast would not double economic growth. Yeah, so so that's interesting. So I, if I understand your point, it's that there's, you know, this thing might be very smart and it might be very good at, you know, high level reasoning. But, you know, if it wants to improve the world, it's going to need like this specific information that it might or or might not have access to. So for example, if it wants to manipulate human beings, for example, I mean, this is like one doomsday scenario. It just manipulates you through your email and gets you to, you know, release some kind of virus or something. Um, That would, you know, require probably knowledge that you just can't get from, I don't know, reading a bunch of journals about human psychology and then uh, just looking at a person's search history, right? You would need sort of, you know, maybe like a less intelligent human being would be better able to manipulate a human being than a super intelligence would, right? Is is that sort of the idea? Just This is just one example of like you need things at the very specific level right. um, in order to be able to control the world. So for the last few decades, many companies have been excited about AI and have said, you know, come use AI, help help our firm. And when AI researchers or applicant experts try to go look for places they can apply AI, one of their main heuristics is, where do you have a lot of data? And so AI has been the most successful in things like games where you can sort of generate the data automatically from the definition of the rules of the game, or maybe, you know, in, in, in something like a biochemistry where you can simulate the biochemistry or where you've got the entire data set of the internet of text where you can try to predict the next text. When you can just get a lot of data, well, then you can use machine learning to to predict things about that data. But most firms out there, when they've tried to f- apply AI, they've realized they just don't have very much data that they can feed into. And in fact, most of them are better off just doing something like a linear regression because modern machine learning techniques just need more data than they have. And that's just the sad fact about most people in the world trying to apply AI, AI is they just don't seem to have enough data nearby on handy to hand to an AI learning algorithm to actually do much. So in order for future computer systems to you know, gain power in the world, they're going to have to either you know, find data of somebody who already knows the world and just use data on their behavior or their thoughts in order to learn that, or they have to go interact with the world in order to learn how the world works. And the world is slow. And it takes a lot of time to interact with the world to find out what works. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. The, that's, uh, that's funny when you say, you know, they, they just go where the data is. It reminds me, it reminds me a lot of social science. I mean, we, we develop theories based on, you know, whether there's a new data set and right. you know, whether it actually matters for what we care about or not. People don't, don't care about, you know, as much. I remember during COVID-19, a lot of people say, well, the science, you know, where the science says this or the science says that. And the science was never relevant to COVID-19 or it was like there, you often find a P uh, like, uh, these experts would come in and say, you know, the health experts believe that we should lie to people <laughs> because X, Y, Z, you know, the science says this, and the, you know, the science of persuasion. And just there's nothing directly analogous like that's even been done. But because they have data on something in the universe, they say whatever this 
peer reviewed paper, whatever this data said about this one thing, you know, must apply to our, our new situation. Right. Um, so so yeah. academia and science in general, including medicine, t- tries to give the impression they have vast data sets on all, everything you want, and they're doing all these careful regressions. And if you ask them about anything, they'll have expert knowledge to say. And that is true to some degree on some limited range of things where they have a lot of data. But then there's all the things between their data and their theories where they're kind of interpolating and speculating. And they aren't so honest about how they don't know those things quite as well. Like the fact, I mean, most medical treatments do not have a randomized experiment that test their efficacy. Uh, there are a few, but most of them don't. Right? And most variations that doctors use haven't been tried out in that way yet. You know, the idea of a randomized trial is this, you know, gold standard that we say, look, you can trust medicine because they do randomized experiments, except mostly they don't, right? In the same way for social science and mostly the rest of the world. Like most of the experts we trust in most of things in the world are interpolating from some places where they have a lot of data to the places they don't. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the treatments aren't, uh, don't all medical treatments, I mean, aren't the new ones, don't they all have to go through a ran, uh, randomized control trials for the FDA or, or no? Only drugs, not Only most drugs. Okay. Okay. So if the doctor, you know, tells most you. treatments are drugs. And of course, once you get a drug approved, it can be used for many other yeah. things. Which, Off-label which, use. Exactly. Which don't yes, have yeah. randomized trials. Yeah. Interesting. So it's just about getting the hurdle of over the drug use. And then you have this use thing, right. which could be used for anything, which is exactly. sort of funny. Um, is your, uh, so uh, is, is this, you know, this idea about sort of the level of abstraction of knowledge, is this, um, you, uh, would you say, uh, and I'm going to guess you see, I'm, I'm guessing you're going to say it is, but is it backed up by, his, by the history of economic growth from say the industrial revolution has like, you know, what, what portion sure. of growth, Actually, growth do you think has I been mean, good? So if, say you take the history of locomotives, mm-hmm. you can graph on the history of locomotives, like their speed or their energy efficiency. And you can see that the graph is relatively steady, but with some jumps once in a while. And that's, re- you know, that's surely showing you the distribution of the sizes of innovations. It's showing you that most, every, most years, the improvement was small. That's because the sum total of all the innovations that year added up to a relatively small change. And then in other years, it was bigger, mainly because maybe there was one or two especially big lumps of improvement. And that's just the nature of pretty much all the technical systems you can see, like even solar cells or whatever. You'll see that they tend to have relatively steady improvements in their abilities because it's mostly lots of little things. And the jitteriness of them, when they jerk a little, that's the sign of of a bigger thing. And by that, you can see that most innovation is composed of many small things and that, you know, big things are fewer. And of course, big things are going to be higher up in an abstraction hierarchy. They're going to typically cover a wider range of, of, of aspects. Yeah. So you have something like, say the history of medicine, you have something like the germ theory of disease, right? You know, so something like that would be a high level of abstraction. And that was, you know, a big deal that led to uh, many changes, right? You have the concept of vaccination. Um, yeah, and you're right. And you, you, I guess what you'd say is that these things matter, but that like if you took the total, there's so few of these things that if you took the small things, like you know, a specific drug works in this specific situation, or this surgical method works for this, uh, you know, there would be something. Well, I don't know if that's uh, that's right. I mean, would you rather just know the germ theory of disease, or would you rather have? Um, you know, a surgeon with all the specific knowledge about the best surgical techniques. I think I'd rather know about the germ theory of disease. Well, you know, so we, we school is organized usually around teaching people the abstractions. Schools mostly don't teach you all the details. And so schools are emphasizing the value of abstractions. So we're giving the students the impression that, expra- that abstraction is really valuable and that it's most everything. And then, of course, students leave school and they start to try to do jobs and they quickly realize they hardly know anything. <laughs> their abstractions have hardly prepared them and they mostly need to learn on the job. That's the basic nature of people when they leave school and have to do things. Uh, but still, learning the abstractions is a good way to sort out the good students from the less good students often. So the pretense uh, is okay there because you have to use something to sort them out. A lot of the history of technology is where specific te- technologies were developed and then the abstraction came later. So the example of the steam engine, people figured out how to make a steam engine, and then they invented thermodynamics to explain the steam engine. And then using thermodynamics, they could more easily invent variations on the steam engine. But um, 
you know, often, quite often abstractions come to rationalize and make sense of things that already work for reasons you didn't understand before. Hmm. So was the, was the germ theory of disease, so vaccines, I think, were like this. I think we had some concept of, I, I've read a few articles on this, we had some concept of vaccination, um, and we knew that if you infect someone with a disease, they you know, before we do anything about the immune system, or if they get the disease, they'll, um, even like, uh, yeah, there was a, there was a, I think it was um, India, there was, they went from India actually to Britain, so there was this folk knowledge about some disease, I forget which one, um, that made its way, and then they, you know, they learned about the immune system eventually, and they had that. Um what about yeah? But what about the the germ theory of disease? Did we did you know the history well enough? Did they notice that if you know you washed your hands, things got better, or did they have to sort of did they have to do experiments and figure out the theory so first? Most I, of these abstract things, you actually need a fair number of more concrete things to make them work. So the most abstract things we know, even say a steam engine, you can't really make a steam engine just knowing thermodynamics. You also need to know some material science about which materials melt at what temperatures and how to make them at what strengths, et cetera. So in fact, um, you know, we often had abstractions long before we had the other parts to make them useful. So uh, people have often looked in the past and blamed people saying, hey, those ancient Greeks looks like they had the basics of a steam engine. And why didn't they make, you know, the industrial revolution? And you might say, well, they understood that... <laughs> Steam had a force here, but they didn't have all the other parts you would need to make a system work. Um, and so we often don't get give enough credit to the other more concrete things necessary to make abstraction work. So for example, take the cell phone, right? You might think, what a great invention to invent the cell phone. But people could forecast long before the cell phone that the, you know, the chips they had at the time and the costs of communication were just way too high to make a cell phone work. And they had to wait until the cost came down. And then there was a point where somebody said, let's take a shot at the cell phone. And it was less about the idea of a cell phone and more about, well, can we get enough towers and can we get enough chips? And, you know, can we make a, a go of this? And it's about sort of a business plan to make a go of something less and not the abstract idea. Yeah. And so here, you know, so here, I guess the, you know, to circle back to the AI, yeah, what we're saying is it's, you know, we're imagining it being very good at abstraction, but even if with its abstraction, it's going to have to know specific things. Do you know anything about the nanotechnology? I don't know anything about nanotechnology, but I, they always, you know, like when I read these doomers scenarios and I wanted to read more of this, but I haven't had a chance. It's like, they're going to build nano something or other that's going to come kill us all. And I, I don't, I know nanotechnology means, you know, something having to do with being very small, but I don't know much of what that means. So why are they, why do they seem so confident that nanotechnology is a way for computers to come get us? Well, um, my friend, Eric Drexler, uh, years ago, wrote a book called Engines of Creation. And then he wrote a later book called Nanosystems and some other systems. And way he basically argued persuasively that it would be possible to make a technology of um, manufacturing and devices that was based on machines where each atom was placed exactly where you wanted it to be. And that wasn't true then, and it still isn't true now. That is, we just we don't have a manufacturing industry where that's a general usual capacity. That that is, it will be possible to make mach manufacturing machines that do that, but. And once you can do that, you can make more of them and then they can make many devices and then we could have powerful abilities to use such devices. And he could calculate just how you know faster computers could be or other sorts of cheap other devices could be if you could put every atom where you wanted. And it's possible to use standard chemistry and quantum mechanics, et cetera, to actually make computer models of these devices and how they would work and show how effective they would be. But we just aren't really at the point of being able to cheaply actually put each atom where we want it. And so it's an envisioned future technology where you could just do a lot more things. Now, obviously, if you were the first person to have nanotechnology, <laughs> then you would have a huge advantage over other people in the world in making devices or computers or weapons or other sorts of things. It would be a really, you know, breakthrough technology. So, uh, I mean, I think if they postulate FOOM, they also want to postulate something like this, a big leap forward in capabilities that would then allow a system to have a big, powerful advantage. And then you'd have to postulate that in order to make one of these manufacturing devices where, you know, you can actually put the atoms exactly where you want cheap enough and then do it at scale. If you thought, well, computing power is the limiting factor. The reason we can't do that now is you just haven't computed it well enough. 
And so they think the smart computer, it could figure out how to better compute the simulation of these nano machines and the nano factory. And then this AI, if it was smart enough to figure out how to and assemble a, you know, to start creating a nano factory, then it could be the first one with nano factories, and then it could be the first one with nano weapons created in the nano factories, and then it has this big technological advantage. But, I see. So the 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 nanotechnology is uh, uh, intrigues them because the idea is like the input you would need to create an output is just so small. Is that the idea? So just computer could just needs a few atoms, and that's all it would take. Or, or or that it's just computing that would be the answer. So the idea would be, you know. In order to make a nano factory, a nano machine, it's we don't need like to experiment a lot and try stuff out in chemical labs and write lots of papers to each other. We just need clever enough calculation to figure out the device, and then we send the right instructions to an ordinary, you know, factory now of some sort that puts atoms, and then we make the right sort of thing, and then ta-da, we've taken. Is that, off. Is that any more plausible than say, like, you know, just? figuring out from first principles how to build like a car factory or, or something. Is there any reason to think that that's more likely? Uh, it just better fits into the scenario of a very sudden fast <laughs> takeover, right? If you figure out how to make this nano factory, then it probably could grow very quickly and it probably could have a very rapid impact by comparison with most other things in the world. So if your AI is postulated, it has to have a new design for a tank or a missile or something. And it's slow to make tank factories and missile factories, right? You'll have to, you know, clear some ground or buy something up and send new shipments to it and, you know, do all sorts of things, right? I mean, doing real things in the world can take years, as we know, right? And so if your scenario is this AI takes over, takes over the world in a few months or a week, you need a scenario with only fast things in it. Uh -huh. And so the, because the nanotechnology, the, the, um, the process of building is faster. It requires because they're all really tiny, right? Yeah. Yeah, the process of building faster. It requires uh, fewer. Is there a theoretical reason to believe it requires fewer just inputs like massive matter than, say, a truck company would? Or is it possible that they figure it out and actually you need, like a, you know, like a nuclear power plant or something? You know? No, no. Yeah, I'm, we're, we're very sure just simple chemistry would be enough. So uh -huh. you just have to be clever about arranging uh -huh. the atoms. I and see. Then everything goes well, but you have to be very clever. <laughs> I see. Okay. So I, I see. That's very interesting. So like potentially the, the what we're calling the nano factory, would it look like a factory? It would perhaps just look like a shoebox, a shoebox. Right. right. Uh, and it's just got to move those atoms around. That's very interesting. So how, you know, how, uh, I mean, is it, is it like, is it seen as, is, is nano technology seen as something that, um, you know, something that like cell phones where there isn't any kind of conceptual hurdle we get, we get over. I guess what I'm asking is, is, is it, is there reason to believe that, uh, you know, that, uh, just before we do it, that you could actually control exactly where the atoms are. This is like possible with the laws of physics. Is, is there. So, so what Eric Drexler did an excellent job of is persuading you that there was no fundamental limitation that would prevent uh, us. I think he's, I see. he's right there. Okay. But there's a getting from here to there problem. <laughs> Yes. That is, if you had a little tiny nano factory that could put each atom where it wanted, then you could send it instructions to make machines which had each atom where they wanted, and then you could quickly make millions and billions of these little machines which had each atom where you want. But you don't even have the first nano factory to put each atom where you want, and you're kind of stuck. Uh -huh. You can't make the first item that would make the rest. So that's where we've been for many decades. Eric Drexler wrote his book in the mid-1980s, so it's now almost 40 years. And it looks like it may be another 40 years, at least until this is actually achieved. But if you think, ah, but if only a smart enough machine could figure it out, then you think, aha, you see, it'll then make the first nano factory because it's so much more clever than us. So now the question is, what does it take to get to be clever about nano factories? Is all it takes just being able to think abstractly about your simulation of molecules? Or do you actually have to do real experimentation? and try lots of things, in which case it would take a lot longer. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't it be a smart strategy for a super intelligence to just wait for humans to do all that work and then just sort of, you know, steal their research and, th and then uh, build the factories take over the world? Sure, but under that scenario, the super intelligence has to sit around for decades waiting. Yeah, that could be very <laughs> so they're, patient. They're trying to construct a scenario where the super intelligence takes over the world in a week, basically. So, you know, 
Well, it, it takes over a week once. Like it could be here right now, but it's just so smart. It knows the only way I could kill everyone is with nanotechnology. So whatever, it's got a long time horizon. It says I'm going to wait 50 years and let right. humans do well, the work. We're postulating that this super intelligence is the result and under some organization, right? Some organization has this computer program they're running. And an organization that has a computer program that's running is running different variations on it, looking at its code, you know, seeing what happens when it does things. Most organizations with a computer system are monitoring it and testing it to see what it's like and what it's doing. So uh, right off the bat, we have a problem for imagining that there's this system out there that is a computer system that some organization is using to schedule cab rides or whatever. And it's got this whole other line of thought in its head about its plans to take over the world that the people who run the system never see somehow. It's encoded in some strange thing. And this system is like sitting there biding its time, waiting to figure out how to how to take over the world while it pretends to just schedule cabs. I mean, you know, the, the question is, where does all this code sit exactly? And okay. how does the programmers who set up the system have no idea that this code is there running. Yeah. Okay. Well, so forget, forget, forget about it's waiting. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't matter for the scenario. <clears throat> Imagine we build out of technologies first and then we get the, uh, we get, the, then we get the super intelligence, right? And then it has the goal. And now it can, I guess in a world where nanotechnology is fully mature is the idea that it could build anything with pretty minimal amount of effort. And well, then the, it would. The whole advantage of the nanotechnology in the near term scenario is what it would be the first with nanotechnology. Uh -huh, right. And therefore it would have a huge advantage in a world where everybody has nanotechnology. It using nanotechnology doesn't give it much of an advantage. Mm -hmm. It doesn't I, take over I, the world I, that way. I see. Well, I mean, maybe because like it equalized because we humans have more sort of just bulk mass of stuff and we have distributed sort of, you know, we have firms um, and we have, you know, governments and ways to, you know, coordinate and ways to, uh, you know, log logistical systems and all this stuff. <clears throat> and right now, maybe it's maybe like in 2023, if the, you know, it's the super intelligence wouldn't be a fair fight, but you know, I, I just learned nanotech what nanotechnology is five minutes ago from listening to you. So, you know, I could be saying, you know, stuff that doesn't make any sense. But in, you know, once nanotechnology is mature, perhaps the argument would be um, that uh, the nanotechnology, that basically it's even even the score because all you need is a little bit of matter. And now the super intelligence could be the deciding, deciding factor in the humans versus machines uh, conflict. Well, then you have to postulate that it can design much better nano machines. You see, I see. Everybody <laughs> You're at the same. Point. If everybody has nano machines, then already yeah. has you know we have nano detectors, and we're watching for other people's nano machines, and we're defending against other people's nano weapons, right? And then in a world where everybody has this nano stuff, the AI can only get an advantage if it's going to have better versions of those things. So then it has to find. Then you have to say, well, it's going to use its extra cleverness to figure out much better versions. Of course, you could do that today. You could say, my, you know, so. Some people have said, well, you know, there's a stock marketplace where you can make money if you're clever. And so why an AI, well, it would naturally go to the stock market and use all its cleverness to like make a lot more money in the market, right? And if you thought all it takes is better algorithms in order to make money in the market, you think, well, then it'll just take over the world because it'll own everything, right? You think, well, you know, just thinking in your own head is not so great a way to just figure out how to win the markets. Most of the people who make money in the markets, they're connected to the world and they're getting information about the world and they're talking to people and they're using that information. It's very hard to compete in that space. So how does this machine so much better at that? Well, I mean, the, this scenario is a little bit easier for me to imagine because it's connected to the internet, right? It can read every language, right? It can read the newspapers right. of every language and, and get all that information. It can maybe read into people's emails. It can... Uh, Right, but uh, all the other hedge funds have that ability too, right? So we're postulating the world where yeah. there's lots of AIs. In order to postulate that this AI takes over, we have to have it be much better than the rest. That's the trick of the No, why, why, can't, why can't it just be one, AI, one hedge fund that invents this AI? Well, at the moment, there are many hedge funds that already have AIs. They're already yeah. trying to use those. So you can't be the first, first hedge fund with an AI anymore. Right. You have to be the first with a certain kind, right, that was much better than the rest. And so, again, we get back to the scenario. Somehow you postulate somebody's system with an AI has this innovation that makes it vastly better than all the other systems in the world. And then it can rapidly and vastly improve its capabilities in a very short time. Yeah. Okay. So what is... Um, so. Uh, what would you give to the probability? I mean, uh, we'll we'll move on from the doomerism scenario uh, right now. But before we do, let me just ask you: What do you think is the possibility that uh, Eliza Yudowski is uh, completely right, and our you know our heads will explode in uh, you know in some time in the near future? 
Well, less than 1%. <laughs> okay. Well, well, is it less than 0.1% point? Oh, this matters for existential, existential risk. So, I mean, the subtler question is, if there was a big problem, would did this be the right time to work on it? And I'm even more confident that if there is a big problem, we're still not at the point where this is the time to work on it. That is, we need to see, if there's going to be a problematic out-of-control system, we need to see a version of it that's more concrete and closer to what the problematic system is, and then we could start to work on how to deal with that. But at the stage where we hardly have any idea what this problematic system would look like, there's just not that much we can do. Are you are you not convinced that uh, ChatGPT is getting to something closer to uh, uh, intelligence and with Dolly, and you can make these into a modules? Well, of course, are you not getting closer, but look. So as you probably know. Roughly every 30 years, since at least the 1930s, we've had these bursts of concern and attention to exciting, interesting demos of automation and then computers and then AI that make people think, oh my goodness, this could do a lot more than we realized, and could it almost be there? And that's what they said when I was a student in 19, early 1980s, when I left grad school to go off to Silicon Valley to be an AI researcher because I read all these news articles about how AI was about to take over everything. I was duped and wrong at that time, but I think we're just in another era like this, and this will happen again 30 years from now. Chat GPT is just not almost human. Sorry, it's just not close. Uh, but, you know, in the past, people also felt, wow, they looked at the new systems. Every new system, every decade, as said, you say, Nobody's ever done something like that before. And that's been the case every decade, the whole period. And it'll continue to be the case. You know, the question is just, is the system sort of capable of doing most everything a human mind can do? And no, it's just not close to that. Okay. So you're, you're not going to give me a less than, uh, you're not, you, you say more than 99. Okay. That, that's good enough. You don't have to give me one in a thousand or one in a million or yeah. one in a billion or, or whatever. That's yeah, that might be asking too much, but okay. Just very, very unlikely and prob and for practical purposes, probably not worth worrying about. Uh, when, I mean, if you're going to worry about it, what you should do is like save up resources. So you're ready to go when you actually get enough data to do something. You should just build economic growth and we should just, yeah, we should just be as rich as possible. And okay. And, uh, you know, unless I've been mean, on that. When the public shows up in a concrete form, you're ready to mm -hmm. pivot. And, yeah. You know, you're watching for it. You're monitoring. You're looking for the chance that you have a system that might be this sort of a problem and you're ready to jump on it. Yeah. You have a, um, you have another interesting argument about AI. And I think this applies to not just the, um, the, the possibility of foam, but like the other things that people are worried about, like, oh, the AI is going to become like a powerful government or it's going to become like a, an oligarch or something. Um, you know the idea that there's uh, the, you know the principal the principal agent problem. So the, the way I take your argument is that basically um, it's sometimes better um, if you're the principal to have an agent that is not aligned with you, but that is really competent and good at what it's doing, rather than one that's say more aligned and say not as good. So I think that what you're, I think what you're thinking is in terms of economic growth, right? Like the AI, if it's really really smart and really really good at doing things. Um, we're going to get so much wealthier that even if we get a smaller pie, a uh, smaller piece, smaller portion of the pie, uh, we really shouldn't worry about that. Is, is that the argument? Well, so I've got two related arguments. One argument I have in a post long time ago says prefer law to values. I'd say if you were thinking about moving to a foreign country to retire, imagine there's two questions you could ask about this country. One question is, are do the people there agree with me about values? And another is, do people there obey the law? And I think you'd want that second question to be answered for more as a higher priority. That is, in order to keep the peace with the other people in this new country you move to, it's more important to know that property rights are respected <laughs> and that the law will be an intermediary between you than to know that they actually share your values. That's because the law is this, you know, thing that makes you care less about their values as long as they obey the law. So... That says that for AIs, what we'll want them is to be embedded in a larger social legal system wherein they fit in that system and they keep the peace within that system. That is, they follow the rules of that system. And that's the important thing you want to know about them is they've been designed and habit habituated to sit in the sort of social roles that we can interact with comfortably and peaceably. <laughs> we don't need to know what they want or what their values are. We need to know that they can relate to us through property rights and law. Uh, so that's 
one sort of claim about what you should care more about there being law abiding and that you have some sort of legal system between you and them that can adjudicate disputes and encourage good behavior. Uh, then uh, another issue is uh, agency failures, as you talked about the principal agent. So some people in the AI risk community have said that if you have an agent and it gets smarter, your problem of controlling it gets harder. And they have said that you should really worry about a very smart agent because it will just outsmart you and then you really won't get much of what you want with uh, a really smart agent. And I have a post where I say, basically, we have a large economic literature on this principal agent problem. We know a number of parameters that make the agency problem harder, such that agents are, are less well aligned and they have they get more of the pie relative to you. But intelligence isn't one of those parameters. <laughs> and I don't believe that intelligence is such a parameter. I, I don't I just don't believe that on average having a smarter agent is worse for you. I think if you were thinking about hiring a butler or a driver or a, an executive assistant, you'd probably want a smarter one. Uh, in general, that would just go better, even though in principle they could trick you better. But uh, overall, I think it'll go well. Yeah, yeah. Is this? Uh, do you see an analogy here of um, like uh, with nationalism? So you had these uh, decolonization movements in the uh, uh, in the twentieth century, um, and then you have even like ethnic politics today, where it seems like many people want the want to be ruled by people whose values align with them or who look like them, who share their cultural background. But often those people are much worse at governing, and these countries and these communities often end up being being worse off. Do you see is this a sort You're of right. a, a similar mistake? I think I do. I, that is, I think uh, I would, for example, multinationals seem to be just better firms, just better run generally. And so when nations prefer their local firms over multinationals, I think they're making a mistake. They would get more of most everything they want if they more encouraged multinationals to come participate in their economy. And I actually think instead of electing local people in, in you know, political races, I think it would be great if management consulting first firms ran for office. <laughs> On an, on an international reputation, they yeah. basically said, "Look, here's the hundred other places we have run over the last few decades, and the record of how we run on them, and we're going to do this for you here if you elect us." And I think that would probably be better than electing the local guy who says he loves you and he grew up in your town and he's going to do well for you, but he doesn't have a track record, and people like him haven't done so well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's even like in the economy where we like love small, even this within the same country, we love small businesses and we hate big business and, you know, the big business on competes a small business, but we don't care. We somehow think the small business has better values. And the local small business, especially yeah, our right. nearby small business, we supposedly try to favor. Yeah. Yeah. You see these, you see these signs of the, yeah, the, the, you know, the store, you know, so uh, I buy local. Know, yeah. Look, yeah. It's like, yeah, who cares? Right. <laughs> it's, it's very, it's a very silly thing. Uh, is the, um, would that, would that imply that like the, would this have a, would this have an implication for like the federalism debate, like the American federal government, you know, people who, like they generally, the federal government jobs, I think pay better than state government jobs. I think most people think like the FBI is probably more um, professional than most, you know, local police forces. Um, you know, there's it, certainly a related thing for nonprofits versus for profits. Like some people would rather go to a nonprofit hospital thinking that somehow they care more about them. And, I don't think it's it actually helps you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, caring about you is great, but it's it's not you know it's not necessary. I mean, people probably didn't care about you know it, it, we didn't you know society right. didn't take have an economic takeoff you know after the industrial revolution because people started caring about each other more. I mean, they right. might have cared about each. They probably cared about each other more you know much more in the distant past and probably small but it, villages in like the that. forager world of a, of a million years ago and you know up until even the farming revolution probably it just was really important to gauge who around you sort of liked you and shared your values. And that probably was a big indicator of who you could work well and trust. It's just in, I mean, the main thing that's happened in the last few centuries, we've vastly expanded the size of our organizations and they're quite alien to our, you know, evolved experience. And yes, we are, we are in a world where we're trying to trust our intuitions, which are based on very small scale groups uh, in order to deal with pretty alien, strange, new super intelligence. Yeah. The uh, uh, yeah, okay. So this is um, this has been sort of a um, this has been an optimistic conversation. I want to, I want to, I want to 
I want to believe you because the other, you know, the other side is, you know, selling sort of doom and gloom. Um, is there a, would you, so you well, said, let me give you the doom side of it. I'll give you my doom side. Okay. Which is just to say, uh, if we continue to have a competitive world, then we will continue to have competition that changes the world. And then the things that win the competition in the future won't be you. They'll be maybe descendants of you, but they'll be quite different from you. And their values will probably be different from you. That is, the world will select for competitive winners and whatever values it is that produce those competitive wins. And that's probably not your values. So you should probably expect the future to be different if it competes. And I think many people kind of are scared of that. They, they, they don't want competition because they think competition will drive our descendants to be strange. Robin, what if, what if I'm a Nietzschean and my value is just winning and whatever is winning is great. And you're pretty lucky then. You get <laughs> it, right? How many people are like that? <laughs> I just love winning. So whatever wins I'll, I'll be satisfied with. Uh, well, if yeah, you just want a universe where something wins, then you're even happier, right? It doesn't even <laughs> right. If it's you, just, right. Just some, as long as something wins, I like it. Well, I want, I want it to be conscious. I mean, if, if they're unconscious, oh, machines, okay. well, you be, have other constraints now. Uh, yeah. I, I, I that, that would be, and I'd, you know, prefer the species homo sapien, although I'm not like completely, you know, completely right into right it, but yeah, I, I'd want the conscious that, that scares me. Like if they're, you know, robots and maybe it's a gradual thing right. and the robots are fighting and, Humans, so, but there's no, there's no consciousness. So this is why I've actually tried to think a fair bit about what will win the competition in the long run. And I think I've come to some at least rough conclusions that I can guess about what how we will change as a result of competition over the coming centuries. And so I don't know if you like them or not, but at least it's something we can think about. We could draw some actual concrete conclusions. Yeah. Well, say more. I'd be I'd be interested. Okay, so that. for example, uh we, we have a good theory about why humans discount the future, which is because uh, our children share roughly half our genes. And that's a reason to, when we're trading off resources on us now or our children a generation from now, we have roughly a factor of two discount rate per generation. But that's a result of sexual selection. And so with asexually reproducing creatures like, in you know, investment funds, they should not have that discount rate. And so eventually we should, the universe should be dominated by creatures who do not discount the future. They might discount growth with the usual logarithmic discount of growth size, but they would not discount time. And so eventually the claim is we will no longer neglect the future. We now neglect the future because of this innate discount rate of a factor of two per generation, but there will come a time when we do not neglect the future anymore. Hmm. So the, they won't make so when you say something like uh, so today, so you imagine like this could be this because it's probably ongoing, right? You mentioned events, investment firms, so there are probably some that chase quick returns, and there are probably some that are long term. Do you think in the in the, in the long term, in a hundred years, uh, we'll have investment firms that have longer time horizons? Well, so we know a lot actually about the selection effects in, among investment firms in a competitive investment world. There's people have done a lot of mathematical work on that actually. <laughs> and so we, we know that um, if we allowed it, investment firms would just grow because historically say the rate of return on investment has been higher than the rate of return of growth, the rate of growth of the economy investment would in fact grow as a fraction of the economy. And the reason that it hasn't so far is that we have prevented that through law. So, so, we have, in fact, in the past, prevented investment firms from just reinvesting all their money and just devoting their cause to that. So in when you create a foundation, say when you die, there's rules about how much of the foundation's money have to be spent each year so that it cannot grow in this way. Uh, but if we allowed investment firms to last arbitrarily long with arbitrarily, you know, giving a high percentage of their reinvestment, then they would come to dominate the economy and they would force interest rates down to equal growth rates <laughs> and uh, they would dominate investment choices in the economy. And people have envisioned that and that's why they made these legal rules to prevent it because they said, we don't want the dead hand of the past to determine our world. And if we allowed this, then the dead hand of people who died and gave their money to investment firms would be ruling our world. So, but, but I still think eventually whether through investment funds or just other somewhat form of selection, we will have creatures who no longer discount the future. And that's a thing we can predict about the future.
So I can't. Uh, so I, so I can't uh, leave behind an estate that uh, so I spends money and you know I say don't spend any money for a hundred years yeah. and then do X Y Z. You because, cannot do that. Hmm. And the uh, you can leave uh, it to your uncle and give him. The, you can leave uh, it to your nephew and give him those instructions. But you know what? Yeah. He might not follow them. Right. Uh, the and what about and you the, wouldn't be legal obligated to do so. And, and what are they? What are they? What are they? What are the restrictions on investment firms that stop them from just uh, investing all their money? Because they have owners, and the owners will ask for some of the money. That is, oh well, yeah. But but you but, said that there was some restriction that made them. So uh, if you try to have a will that creates a foundation, you see after you die, and just make it and reinvest all the money, then it isn't allowed to do that. If you try to reinvest all your personal money, you can do that. But then you know you're. When you die, that money will go to whoever inherits your money, and they may yeah. not continue this policy. But I thought you said, I thought that you said there was an analog to this dead, uh, dead hand of the past rule in uh, uh, the way investment firms work. Did I did I misunderstand? I just, so like there's that? an analog. There, there's just that rule in in wills. Uh -huh. You okay. can't Got it. use your will to create a foundation that just reinvests its money. You can do that yourself as long as you're as lying. But as soon as you die, whoever you give that money to will get to choose their own policy. They may want to spend it all. Which okay. So okay. So well, we, we prevent. So that's one area of life we we prevent from letting the uh, letting things change. What else is gonna sort of the is gonna maximize over time? Or is it? Do what about the what about you think? Um, uh, even like uh, families and cer certain uh, genetic populations and communities, right? There's people. There's like the Amish, right? Um, who I, this is not conscious. I don't think I, they think that in a hundred so, years they're gonna. So I actually think like relatively soon we're just going to be replaced with artificial descendants who aren't going to reproduce with the usual dna method that's just not that method of reproduction is not going to last that long much longer oh, we're going okay. to make our descendants in factories out of explicit designs but natural selection will still continue in that world it will just continue with these new kinds of genes which aren't dna but i think we can predict things about that world in fact i think we can predict that you know eventually we will have creatures whose value is in their minds. I want to reproduce. Mm -hmm. That is today we reproduce because we have preferences that are indirectly inducing reproduction. We want yeah. sex, we want status, etc. And by wanting these things, our behavior tends to produce children. And that's what evolution has been counting on for us to reproduce. But in fact, that's not very reliable as the environments change. These evolved habits don't necessarily make us reproduce as much as we could and that's why we're suffering this vast fertility decline but why why, why why can't the humans you know, the human communities that already have this in their brain why 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 is it that just they would take over the world because there are there are communities that just oh, want to maximize it up there no, sure i mean just artificial is just better in so many other ways it's, this isn't the reason why artificial wins this is just something that happens with artificial after artificial well wins. maybe those people are least inclined to pursue artificial you know there's like the, the, the humans who don't want to reproduce are going extinct and, the, uh, and they but they're right. the they're the technophiles and the humans who um do want to explicitly reproduce sure. are the technophobes well, over the next millennia there'll be a slow selection effect among humans for the old. ones who reproduce but there may the switch to artificial may just happen well before then, in which case we'll just have a world. So my book Age of M is a scenario like that, where basically mm -hmm. the emulations are artificial creatures and they reproduce a different way, and then they they quickly dominate humans mm -hmm. in that scenario. Do you think um, do you think they'll be conscious or not? Because I, I, yes. I they will be conscious. Yes, I think so. Uh, and why do you think that? Well, first of all, I just think I'm a physics person who just thinks you know stuff and stuff in our physical universe is conscious when it can be because that's the only reason our brains may make sense for our brains to be conscious there's nothing special about our brains that makes us conscious they're just ordinary physical devices in our universe so if our brains are conscious i'd guess most everything else that could be oh, us. so you're, you're you you subscribe to panpsychism well i said that could be that that's the key uh -huh. constraint it could be okay <laughs> so panpsychism would be everything i need uh -huh. nothing couldn't be. well so what percentage of things are, are conscious to you I mean, I, I would think if it can compute what its conscious feelings are, that's a good indication. That is, it really can't have conscious feelings unless it can compute them. And computing conscious feelings is actually quite a restriction on a, on a system. Most systems don't do that. So oh. in order to know what, in order to feel something, your body, has, your mind has to compute what you feel. Mm. It has to calculate that. And that's a bunch of work. So, so my computer, 
it can compute, you know, it's getting too hot or it's getting too, you know, whatever. And it can, uh, you know, it has the system updates. And things. Do you think that our computers are conscious? In some way, but yeah. not in the way you are, because, <laughs> right. you know, you don't, that their consciousness doesn't feed into other things in the way yours does. Interesting. Uh, but so I just don't think there's just physics. There isn't anything else. So the answer to these questions just have to be in the physics, you know, some physical arrangements are conscious clearly. And the question is how, how does the universe tell which physical arrangements are conscious? The simplest answer would be any of them that could be conscious are, that would be a simple way the universe could figure that out. Uh, I don't, you know, anything else would have to be a lot more complicated. And the question is, where does the universe compute this, figuring out which things are conscious? <laughs> so I'd say the fundamental principle is computation happens in physics. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So if there's something that has to be computed in order for things to work in the universe, it happens in physics. Physics is the thing that computes it. And so if you're conscious, that's being computed somehow. And so it's either a very simple rule that doesn't require much computation or it's a complicated one. And then it's complicated, computed in, in something that computes, like your yeah. brain. Yeah. So whatever, so whatever we create will be somewhat like a human and somewhat like a, a computer. And humans, we know, are conscious. And you think computers are probably in some way conscious. So a sort of thing that's sort of like a human computer hybrid would probably itself be, be conscious. Is that right. the idea? What else could it be? I guess is the question. Like, I don't know. It could be that there's just something. Yeah, I guess. What else could it be? It could be that just carbon-based life is different than silicon-based. I don't know. I have. No I mean, so, I mean, I know enough. Carbon is just a certain number of you know protons in the nucleus. That's all it is. How does the universe care about the number of protons in a nucleus? How is it? How does that work? I mean, it doesn't make any sense as a theory. Well, the, the universe. I mean, the universe doesn't. I mean, they're not the universe cares i don't know if that's the right way to think about it but it's like like for example like uh you know your your the human body has certain properties that machines don't have in the sense that like okay it's uh uh you know like the, the, it's wet for example and you know machines tend to be tend to be dry right that's one of the simplest right. things you can imagine and so like consciousness could just be like well, I mean, we don't know. We don't know. It's, uh, to me, I, so this is where I, being a physicist come in. Like, as a physicist, I say, look, these are the concepts that make sense as the fundamental physics concepts. So if there's something true about the universe, it needs to be expressed in terms of these fundamental physics concepts. And you know what? Wet isn't one of them. Wet is a very high-level abstraction. And it's not, you know, you might, because, look, in some sense, you don't know if any of the rest of other humans on the world are conscious. You don't know if you were even ever conscious in the past. In principle, you could just be remembering then you thought you were conscious and you never were. So you're postulating perhaps that all the brains in the world of humans are all conscious, but what's the basis for that? I mean, you're basically assuming some generality. Well, it's because they're kind of similar, but I'd say like wet versus not wet, that's that's actually similar in terms of basic physics. That There's nothing fundamental about wet versus not wet that makes any sense as a distinction unless you... So you might, might, might say, well, only people in the Northern Hemisphere are conscious, right? I mean, that's a line you can draw, but it seems pretty arbitrary to me. Wet versus not wet seems just as arbitrary in terms of basic physics. Uh, but, uh, you know, process, so processing information to you is, seems more fundamental in the, in, the, in the realm of physics than wet versus dry? Well, the key thing is, if, some, if there's going to be a distinction, it has to be computed somehow. That is, there has to be a physical process that results in that distinction being figured out right and so the universe either there's a physical law that by which an evolution of things figure it out or it's an arbitrary label i mean where where does this label come from right that that, that is i'm gonna i have a strong prior to integrating whatever this other thing is with all the other physics things we understand so there's a physical universe that has a certain set of properties a certain set of things we understand those things and you know what i'm going to stick with those things that would be reluctant to add other things unless you show me some evidence that there's other things yeah i i started reading the age of m a, yeah, a long time ago and i uh it lost me when it got to the sort of uh, the side uh you know the side well, aspect but i should probably uh, are these ideas are your ideas of consciousness are they are they found in there no no i i, I mean i tried to avoid that sort of because that's just a that's a rabbit hole that people just get sucked down to so oh. as you may know there's some sort of honeypot topics out there that just suck people in and there's just not yeah. much value in them and mostly yeah. people should avoid them <laughs> yeah. and so that's one of the consciousness is one of these topics if you get sucked in there's just endless cycles you can go through talking about things and there's just <laughs> not much ever comes out of it like there's yeah. nothing you can do with any of this stuff 
And so I'm very attentive to like, let's think about the stuff we could do something with if you figured it out. Mm. And yeah. that's where yeah. I go. And I guess I, you must think AI alignment then is like the biggest uh, honeypot uh, in all choices. It is a big honeypot. Yes, a lot of people in our world are sucked into it. And it's interesting to speculate why. I mean, so I actually think one of, we've talked about abstractions. One of the key distinctions in the world between the people I've liked and the people I don't like as much is just, I like to hang around people who just have a taste for abstraction. <laughs> So people with a taste for abstraction, they tend to think abstractly about decision theory and about quantum mechanics and about utilitarianism. And there's just a whole range of abstractions that this, they gravitate toward because you can talk about things at an abstract level and you don't have to get dragged down with the details. And they just they just like that. And this is one of those topics, right? People can talk about AI alignment in the abstract and they hardly need to know any details. And it's so it's, and it seems important and almost a comic book story and, you know, it, it gets sucked in, but I mean, in general, I like abstraction. I like to think about abstractions. I think it's fun to think about quantum mechanics and, and utilitarianism and algorithm design and all these sorts of things. But you just, one of the most important skills in the world is to judge when to reason abstractly and when to reason concretely. And often in a conversation, you go, have to go back and forth several times. <laughs> and so. You know, I, I'm wary to get sucked into certain details. And I say, where are we going with this? I don't get it. I don't see what all the value is. And I have to be wary about certain kinds of abstractions, certain kind of abstractions. I go, is this this word or is there really a thing behind this? <laughs> and so we talked about that with intelligence, like, okay, what kind of an abstraction is intelligence? What kind of a thing is behind that? Is just, is that just like better, just betterness, another name for like stuff we like, or is there a thing in the world that corresponds to it? Yeah. Yeah. And so it sounds like what your, your, your sort of your difference with a lot of these people. So the people, they like apps, they like abstractions and I, I like abstractions too, but they are more in the, you know, you like to get somewhere too, right? You have, you well, just sort of selective. Right. In. Well, for example, I have abstractions about economic growth, but tied to our history of economic growth. That is, I've seen what we know about the history of economic growth and history of innovation. And I've tried to tie my abstractions to those observations so that they are grounded in that way. And then I feel much more confident in what I would say about innovation because it's tied to that concrete data. And that's what I want to do with abstractions. I want to not, if they drift too far away from concrete data, then they can often just go off the rails in strange directions. And so it's quite an art, I think, to have concrete data, to jump away from it to the right level of abstraction. So you're not lost, you're not dragged in by arbitrary details, but you don't get too far away from it. Because otherwise you could, so for example, people who talk about, you know, capitalism or other things like that, you know, the whole world of Marx is, has these world of these floating abstractions <laughs> and they just are often quite a distance from any sort of concrete social phenomena you might be interested in. Like they talk about exploitation, you go exploitation, like what, what is that? Let's, let's, let's look at, show me where exploitation is, right? But they don't care that you can't like cash it out in concrete situations. They just talk in these abstractions. And that's just a big risk of people who like abstractions is they will talk about abstractions that have just become detached that are, that are not tied down well enough by concrete details. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was a, yeah. I mean, people, when they talk about politics, I see this a lot. I saw this yes. tweet um, a week or two ago. It's like, don't be fooled. You know, the left will never give up power voluntarily. Okay. And there, there are so many abstractions. Okay. First of all, <laughs> oh, who's the left? Right. Yeah. Yeah, what's power happened? exactly? Yeah, you know, what is the power? What does give up voluntarily? They lose an election, and then they, you know, uh, you know, uh, Obama leaves office, and then Trump takes office. So is that voluntarily, right. or they lost the election? And they're trying right. to make some kind of, like, almost like you know, we have to go to complete war against these people, but it, it's just meaningless. And and so much of like political discussions are like this. Like the right is this, the left is that. Um, you know, they, they they there's a have you ever right. read Curtis Yarbrough? So, stuff? I I have in the past, uh, not so much lately, but um, I've actually, in my last few, the last six months, I've been focused on the sacred and we don't have time now, but we can talk about it later. But I think I've recently had an insight that explains a fair bit of this habit. That is, this is a frustrating habit. There's certain kind of topics and people just get abstract and floaty and they don't even want to like be very, just even imagining what that would mean concretely is not a habit they have. And I think I've come up with a, a way of understanding why that happens on sacred related topics. So oh, uh, that is a temptation for later. We don't have time for that today, but if you want to come back and talk, we will do that some other time. 
Okay. Okay. Can you give us a, a, a nutshell, a, a sort of a, a nutshell, or, or do you want to? So, so basically, uh, the sacred's been in my way in a sense all my life. I finally was frustrated enough. I said, "Let's study this thing." And so I collected fifty or so correlates of the sacred that things people say go along with things that are called sacred. And I looked for theories that people had to explain these things. I picked one I thought was pretty good, and then I, it explained some of them, but not others. And I came up with an alternative add-on theory to explain all of them together. So I think I have a nice unified theory of the sacred, making sense of all these fifty correlates of the sacred, which would then is a powerful toolkit by which you can think about the sacred. You can understand how sacred affects other people and yourself because everybody has stuff that's sacred even you or i we won't give it up nobody's going to give up all of the sacred and so it's important to figure out what it is how it works and how to minimize its harms and maximize its advantages is it is it, ju- is it just like a uh, is there a level of sort of a synthesis of these things or is it just like a 50 item checklist of well, no, that's a- I take the 50 items, I clump them into seven clusters, each of which has a general theme, and then I try to explain these clusters. And one simple theory that I take from Durkheim explains three of the seven clusters, and then I add one other theory and explains the other four. And so now I've got a unified theory of all the clusters from one simple ancient theory plus my one new add-on, and I've got a unified account. So it's not just a list of them, it's a unified theory explaining why all these 50 things are there. Yeah, and it, okay, I'm looking forward to this. What's the time? Is you going to write this up? What's the timeline on I this? I have written it up. Uh, so I, you can see my recent post on the sacred. I have a paper whose title basically, I think, is We See the Sacred from Afar to See It Together. We see the that's sacred from afar. Oh, okay. So this is, this that's is my key okay. insight of, to explaining these other four correlates. Okay. I looked at anyway, This is a tease to like, we have to end soon here because we've been talking yeah. for an hour sure. and 30 minutes. Uh, but, uh, yeah. No, yeah, we've uh, we've got. I've been working on the last six months, so I'm pretty proud of coming up with a coherent account of what <laughs> seems to be a pretty fundamental human behavior. Okay, well, so I'm conscious of your time, Robin, is there any um, uh, is there any uh, anything else you're working on that you want to let people know about before before we let you go? Well, that was it. That was my pitch. <laughs> okay, great. Well, it's been great having you on, and yeah, we'll have you back to talk about that other stuff. Mm-hmm.